Notwithstanding the potential for a, a few of these major um, tail events, which are increasingly moving towards the center of the distribution in terms of probability. But I mean, even just a base case, if we, if we manage to navigate through some of these um, macroeconomic and, and geopolitical landmines over the next few years, it, it seems like you're aligned with the view that due to a scarcity of labor, um, a political climate that is motivated to um, reorient the wealth distribution um, and, you know, potentially a restricted flow or a cost of capital that, you know, there's, there's just a lot of general scarcity over the, out there relative to the potential for further demand shocks, whether it's, you know, just because we've got a lot of money in the bank from past fiscal largesse or the fact that there's going to be you know, more and more fiscal largesse over, over subsequent years, not just in the U.S., but in, in most kind of uh, developed foreign economies as well. Um, so, I mean, notwithstanding, you know, the potential for major tail events, uh, how would you or how are you advocating for uh, investors to position here? Just, to, you know, like what is a strategic asset allocation look like uh, in, in, this, in this environment? And, and what are some adjunct strategies that, that you think might be highly complementary, especially over the next decade? So, um, so the, we go through cycles where, uh, where as a people, we see uh, capital markets as the most efficient uh, allocator of capital. And then we go to periods like we are now, whether people kind of realize it or not, where we start to say, hey, capital markets aren't fair. You know, free market economics doesn't necessarily work for everybody. And we choose for government to be a more fair or, you know, efficient allocator of capital as we choose it to be. And if we're prioritizing the median outcome, where government's going to have to be very involved. So um, I think it's fair to say that um, government is going to be sit at the, the spout of where money is flowing for the foreseeable future. That was the case during the Great Society program of the 60s and 70s. That was the, the case for the New Deal during the 1930s. Um, and so I think that's the case now. Um, and again, uh, about a year ago, when we, after the first fiscal wave started, everybody said, oh, we, we won't make that mistake anymore. And then came the Inflation Protection Act. And the you know the, right, which itself is fiscal stimulus and and uh, you know or forgiveness of of, of debt uh, et cetera. So we are going to continue. Um, and this again, going back to the sixties and seventies, Nixon was uh, the probably most laissez-faire Republican uh, on the stump and and broadly uh, thought of as such. Um, but he actually did more than Lyndon B. Johnson did in terms of fiscal stimulus. Uh, when it when when the rubber hit the road, because that's what the populist uh, zeitgeist of the time demanded, right? Um, he's the one that instituted price controls. Price, price controls themselves are fiscal stimulus, right? Um, and so I think we're going to continue, and I think that's the biggest trend you can expect, is continue to see policies that help defer the costs uh, of inflation on people. Uh, through some type of fiscal stimulus, whether that's price controls or first-time homebuyer tax credits or uh, you know free health care or student loan forgiveness, right? That whether you're right or left, I think that's popular and and uh, and we've seen that to date, and I think that'll continue. So if you take that as an assumption, uh, you know, then you want to sit next to government. Uh, you want to sit at the mouth of the river and uh, and drink from the mouth of the river. So. Uh, the mouth of that river, uh, you know, the, go look at the budget of the U.S. government line by line and, uh, you know, go look at uh, whether it's uh, housing and urban development or infrastructure or health care. I think health care is an underappreciated uh, opportunity in the next decade, given its need for technological innovation and our ability to kind of um, to, to solve some of those problems uh, through government. Um, uh, you know, defense, defense spending. I was just, you know, took the words out of my mouth that we live in an increasingly hostile, you know, uh, competition world. Uh, guess what? Uh, that probably a good time to, 
uh, invest in, in defense. Um, and so all of these trends we've been talking about for a year and they've all been incredible trends, but resource scarcity, uh, that means commodities, right? I think as well documented at this point uh, where uh, energy is about three and a half percent of the S&P 500 in 1982, it was 30% or so. Um, those are extremes. I'm not saying we're going straight to 30%. It's up from 1.75%. It's a it's a double, right? But we've been talking about that as it's doubling, and I think this is just the beginning. So I think you're in a secular trend there. Um, so there's there's uh, there's a few uh, labor scarcity we talked about. Okay, so uh, if you're going to have to rotate away from China, um, it's probably pretty good for Mexico. Um, it's probably good for onshoring domestic uh, manufacturing. Um, you know, energy is a lot cheaper here than it is in Europe. Uh, you know, one way you close that gap is you just move operations from Europe to the U S. Um, so there's a lot of structural trends in place that, and, and these are to be clear when you, everybody's like burying their head in the sand saying, woe is me. You know, I can't buy the dip in dollar cost average indexes. There are massive opportunities in this market, right? We're on the turn here. And, and the key is just not to be, uh, it's not about beta. It's actually, let's go think about what's happening in this world and let's actively manage a portfolio. Uh, active management has withered on the vine for the last 40 years because it's too expensive and it's much easier to just close your eyes, buy an index and watch it go up 15% a year and close your eyes when it goes down in dollar cost average. Well, guess what? When that stops working, it's worth paying uh, you know, 2% or whatever to an active manager who knows what they're doing who can generate returns. Um, so I think there's a massive move to active management from passive. I think passive, uh, which is compounded, at, you know, for 40 years and has created some trillion dollar investment entities that all they do is 60, 40, um, investment. I think that stuff, uh, you know, goes the way of the dodo. Now, I don't think passive investment in the sense of, uh, simplified products is going on. I think there's a secular trend in that, but I think you're going to see a lot more liquid alternatives. I think you're going to see a lot more passive vehicles that are non-correlated opportunities as well.